The Association of the U.S. Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's Thought Leaders webinar series, a new webinar series featuring military leaders and contemporary military authors. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's Vice President of Education, Lieutenant General Guy Swan. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Thought Leaders webinar series. Thank you for joining us for today's event. And while we wish we could both be together here at AUSA, that's obviously not possible in the current environment. So instead, we've crafted a series of events to bring you senior Army leaders, authors, and other personalities speaking on topics of interest to America's Army, all in a live and virtual forum. We're glad you've joined us today, and we really appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our great nation. Our topic today is an appropriate one, given that, given that yesterday was Veterans Day. 2020 marks the 45th anniversary of the official end of the Vietnam War, a conflict that deeply affected our nation. The war also had a profound effect on the United States Army, and especially on those like me who grew up in the post-Vietnam Army. We learned a lot from those who went before us and served in Vietnam. And we're still learning a lot from that conflict. A good, bit of, a good bit of that learning comes from authors like the panelists we have here with us today, who continue to write about their experiences and the experiences of others during the Vietnam War. Joining us today to discuss their new books are Mr. James D. McElroy and Mr. Gregory Sanders, who are the authors of Bait, The Battle of Cam Duck, and we also have Chief Warrant Officer 5 retired Roger Stickney, who will present Freedom Shield, the 191st Assault Helicopter Company in Vietnam, written by John Falcon. Thank you all gentlemen for being part of today's discussion, but more importantly, thank you for the contribution you've made through these terrific books. To moderate our discussion today, we're also joined by Joe Craig, AUSA's director of AUSA's book program. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Joe. Thank you, sir. And good morning to everyone out there. And we are very excited to present the people behind two new titles in the AUSA book program that discuss the Vietnam War. We've got one is a uh, battle history and the other is a unit history. And for those of you joining us today, uh, please take advantage of having the panelists here to ask some questions. You can use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen to submit any question. And after the authors talk to us about their books, we'll get to as many of those questions as possible. First, we're going to hear about Bait, the Battle of Com Duke, uh, written by Jim McElroy and Greg Sanders. Jim McElroy has a bachelor's degree in literature and master's degree in history from the University of Texas at Austin. And in 1965, with a double draft deferment as a certified high school teacher of, over the age of, of the draft, he voluntarily enlisted in the Army as a private. After completing the basic AIT, Infantry Officer Candidate, Airborne, Ranger, and Jumpmaster courses at Fort Benning, Georgia, the Special Forces Officer course and the Special Forces Vietnam Pre-Mission course at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, and the Jungle Warfare course in Panama, he was finally assigned to the 5th Special Forces Group in Vietnam in 1967. In 1968, after serving five months at Hot Ton SF Camp in Quang Nhai Province in First Corps, he volunteered for the Studies and Observation Group, otherwise known as SOG. He received a top secret clearance and was assigned to Op 35 FOB 4 as the Assistant Operations Officer and Officer in Charge of the Covert Cross-Border Launch Site at Kam Duke SF Camp in Quang Tin Province, First Corps. In his subsequent civilian career, McElroy was an international corporate executive, an international commercial banker, and an international financial consultant. He's now retired and lives in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. His co-author, Greg Sanders, was born in Alameda, California. Sanders grew up in Orange County, where he graduated from Savannah High School in Anaheim. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Political Science, a dual major, from the California State University at Fullerton. Sanders enlisted in the United States Army in 1967. He graduated from an Infantry Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, 
attended the Army Intelligence School at Fort Hollabird in Maryland and the Army Civil Affairs School at Fort Gordon, Georgia, before he was deployed to Vietnam in 1969. Sanders served with the Americal 23rd Infantry Division while, ser while in Vietnam. And following his Army active duty, uh, Sanders attended law school at the Pepperdine University School of Law, where he received a Juris Doctor degree upon graduation. He's been practicing real estate law for 43 years now, and he's a senior partner in the Nassiman Law Firm. Sanders is currently serving as a Lieutenant Colonel in the California State Guard as a JAG lawyer, and he resides with his wife in Indian Wells, California. So Mr. McElroy, Mr. Sanders, uh, thank you both for being here today. Uh, Mr. S Mr. McElroy, we're gonna hear from you first, please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. Of all the large battles at the height of the Vietnam War, the least known and most misunderstood is that of Cam Duc, an obscure U.S. Army Special Forces camp near the remote Laotian border of Quang Tinh province in I Corps. From May 10th to 12th, 1968, it and a small temporary patrol base five miles south of it were attacked by two reinforced regiments, 3,000 or more regular uniformed troops of the North Vietnamese Army 2nd Division. Three days of bombing and strafing by nearly 150 close support aircraft in some 350 sorties, followed by two days of intensive carpet bombing by scores of B-52s, caused an estimated 1,500 to 2,000 NVA casualties. The attackers shot down 12 aircraft, including a C-130 with 183 civilian refugees who were all killed. More than 1,000 U.S. and indigenous defenders were narrowly rescued by Air Force transport planes and Army and Marine helicopters shortly before a monsoon storm closed the airstrip. One soldier in the Marical Division Reinforcement Battalion received the Distinguished Service Cross. Four Air Force pilots received the Air Force Cross, and one Air Force pilot received the Medal of Honor. Bait, the Battle of Kamduk, radically contradicts all previously published accounts of it, and is the only accurate in-depth history of the battle by an eyewitness participant. I was the resident officer in charge of the American and indigenous SOG recon commando troops at the covert top secret cross-border launch site inside the camp. Bait is based on our more than 10 years of primary and secondary research, interviews, and the statements of many other direct and indirect battle participants, including some former NVA officers. In addition to the dramatic tactical details of the combat, Bait explains the battle's role in the grand strategy and political context of the American and North Vietnamese leaders on the eve of the first Paris peace talks. The strategic potential of the battle at that critical point in the war was so significant that former President Lyndon Johnson referred to it in his memoirs. Bait, the Battle of Cam Duc, published by Casemate, is authoritatively documented richly illustrated in color, and endorsed by a four-star former chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. It is also endorsed by a two-star Army Medal of Honor recipient, by a two-star Air Force fighter pilot, by a former Marine Corps colonel, by a professor emeritus of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and by a senior faculty member of the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst, England. The 11 published reviews of it are all unreservedly favorable, and it was a finalist for the Army Historical Foundation's 2019 Distinguished Book Award. Thank you. We we'll turn to your co-author, uh, Greg Sanders. Uh, Mr. Sanders, please tell us about your connection to Com Duke and, and the book. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> In early 1970, I was the Psychological, psychological Operations Officer for the Army's Americal Division at Chu Lai, South Vietnam. I participated in a briefing of General Creighton Abrams, the commander, United States Military Assistance Command, Vietnam, on Operation Elk Canyon 1 in the Division Tactical Operations Center. 
The operation was intended to retake Kamduk and the surrounding area from the North Vietnamese and was conducted jointly with the 2nd Arvin Division. I played a small role in the Elk Canyon 1 operation when it was launched later that month. <clears throat> in order to prepare for and properly brief General Abrams, I had to study the May 1968 Camduck battle in depth. I became fascinated with the battle details, the command and control failures at many levels, and the ingenuity employed by so many battle participants on the ground and in the air who carried the day. I knew then that someday I would write a book about the battle. Beginning in 2006, I conducted some preliminary research about the battle, including a return trip to Cam Duck. Eventually, I was put in touch with Jim McElroy, my co-author, by the chairman of the Cam Duck Club, a loosely knit organization of battle participants. Eventually in 2011, <clears throat> Jim and I had dinner together and agreed to collaborate on the book project. We hammered out a partnership agreement that precisely defined the duties and obligations of each and began to work to piece the book together. The partnership agreement served us well. We each knew what was expected of the other and we consulted frequently with one another as we progressed through our assigned tasks. Jim had a treasure trove of documents he had collected from the National Archives and taped interviews of battle participants he had conducted in the 1990s. I filled in some gaps with additional battle participants via telephone and in person and additional research, particularly of primary sources. Because of the complexity of the battle, we eventually decided to break it down into discrete segments and to write a narrative of each segment. That narrative evolved into a very rough first draft of the book. And while we, con while we continued with our research of both primary and secondary sources, Jim completely revised and polished up the first draft, which eventually evolved into the published version. Over the nine or so years we spent writing the book, we drew on our common educational backgrounds, we both have master's degrees in history, and military experiences. We are both deeply indebted to Vietnam War historian and scholar Dr. Louis Sorley, who recommended our book manuscript to Joe Craig at AUSA, and to Joe for his recommendation of the book to the Casemate Publishing Company. Before turning the mic back to Joe Craig, I want to emphasize that neither Jim nor I had any profit motive for writing bait. Our goal was to simply set the record straight on the Battle of Camduck and to correct the common false narrative about the Vietnam War, how it was fought and why it was fought the way it was fought. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Mr. Sanders. Uh, we appreciate the work that uh, you know, Mr. McElroy put into the book and appreciate your time coming here to speak to us about that. Now we're going to turn to uh, the second book of the, of the morning, uh, The Freedom Shield. Uh, the author, John Falcon, is not able to be here with us today, so Chief Warrant Officer 5, Roger Stickney, is going to speak to us about the book on his behalf. So in early of January of 1969, Army Warrant Officer Roger Stickney was one of several helicopter pilots assigned to the 191st uh, Assault Helicopter Company from another unit. The 191st AHC operated across much of the Mekong Delta in South Vietnam. Captain John Falcon had become the executive officer of the 191st by the time that Warrant Officer Stickney arrived. As with most guys, Stickney began flying combat assaults in UEs, performing infantry troop insertions and extractions almost daily for the bulk of his tour. As was customary, when pilots gained sufficient experience and with peer and unit leadership co confidence, they'd be checked out as aircraft commander and they were given ex increased responsibilities. It was mostly in that capacity, serving as a slick pilot in Vietnam, Warrant Officer Stickney served the 191st AHC and accumulated over a thousand hours of combat flying. So Chief Stickney, please proceed. Thank you, Joe. 
Well over two, uh, two decades ago, some former buddies from the 191st Assault Helicopter Company found each other and held a very informal reunion. That ultimately morphed into forming the active 191st Association with biennial get-togethers welcoming any of us able to attend. The idea gathered lots of welcome steam and it was at one of these that Major Retired John Falcon volunteered to capture the extraordinary stories of the 191st in a book. The Freedom Shield is that book. The fascinating history of the 191st is told by those who lived it. I reconnected with Major Falcon at that uh, same reunion and through our renewed friendship, he later asked me to help with the initial editing of his manuscript. Major Falcon regrets that he cannot be available for this event, but it's my honor that he asked me to visit with you for him today. Air mobile warfare really entered its own once the turbine engine Bell Huey uh, UH-1 was becoming well established around 1962. And sensing an urgent need, then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara quickly assembled a group of experts to figure out how best to employ the helicopter advantage in battle. Since Lieutenant General Hamilton Howes was chosen to lead this effort, it became informally known as the Howes Board. Uh, the mission was to develop, document, and hone helicopter tactics, then validate them through actual testing but all this on a very short fuse. With the massive deployment of helicopters to Vietnam, the need for large numbers of air crews to fill mission-ready aviation units was addressed through development of an eight or nine month Army flight school. The primary entry requirements were a hint of interest in helicopters and a pulse. Almost immediately upon graduation, participants were generally deployed to Vietnam for a year long tour if bad luck didn't intervene, but it often did. As personnel reached the end of their tour, a reservoir of trained replacements was needed. To help meet this growing necessity, an aviation company was formed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. In May of 1967, they were deployed to Vietnam as the 191st to be parceled out as backfill for the combat losses of already established units. However, when the 191st hit the ground in Vietnam, for a reason unclear, their commanding officer was strangely not with them. This absence was noted with displeasure by Major General George Seneff, commander of the 1st Aviation Brigade, as he greeted his newest charge. Without their commander present, General Seneff quickly corrected that on the spot by appointing Major Clarence Patnode, the senior officer present as the new 191st commander. Then in a very bold move by the new commander, Major Patnode convinced General Seneff that the 191st had strong potential to be an effective assault helicopter company in its own right, not just a parts bin for other units. Major Patnode's unusual self-confidence quite impressed the general and earned for the 191st the opportunity to show what they could do. Fortuitously, Major Patnode, a degreed aeronautical engineer, had been a key member of the high-level house board several years earlier. This unique experience made him one of the best prepared leaders to execute air mobile operations at their highest level. This was a challenge Patnode relished. He was a very charismatic leader, with an extraordinary gift for eliciting the best from his staff and for earning fierce loyalty from his entire unit. With heavy responsibility and demands of unit leadership, commanders typically rotated after several months before burnout set in. But with Patnode having established a robust operational template, the die was cast for the 191st to succeed as a record-setting combat organization. For the next four years, the unit served in Vietnam with legendary distinction known as the Boomerang Lift Ships or the Slicks, the Bounty Hunter Gunships, and Wing Nut Maintenance Platoon. The Freedom Shield traces the activities of the 191st from its earliest formation to its eventual return to U.S. soil. In 26 diverse chapters, you will experience many stories of life and death in an assault helicopter unit 
responsible for hauling troops to the fight and for bringing them home. Without protective close air support of the bounty hunter gunships, the tide of battle would far oftener favor the uh, prepared enemy. However, troop insertions and extractions with escorts carrying lethal rockets, mini guns, and grenade launchers were very welcome additions to the limited firepower available to each of the slick crews. Reading the Freedom Shield, you will sense that you are actually there, watching the action as though you are on the intercom with the air crew. The book highlights a cross-section of commanders, support hands, mechanics, cooks, pilots, crew chiefs, and many memorable operations where heroes were made. Sadly, war takes a toll. <clears throat> and the losses need to be recognized and appreciated with reverence. <clears throat> the Freedom Shield does that too. And I guarantee you will find this book full of action and very hard to put down. It's a great read. Thank you. And thank you, Chief Stickney. Again, we really appreciate you being here and covering for your battle buddy, John Falcon, to talk about the Freedom Shield. And thanks again to uh, Mr. Sanders and Mr. McElroy for taking time out of your schedules as well. So I welcome everyone uh, again to uh, you send in questions using the Q&A tab on the side of your screen. And uh, we'll now uh, turn to our panelists. And uh, the first question we have, uh, I'll address to Mr. McElroy, uh, it's about Special Forces. And the question is uh, about the relationship uh, between U.S. Army Special Forces soldiers and the indigenous uh, South, Viet South Vietnam Army soldiers and other militia. Would you speak to us about that? <clears throat> yes. Uh, if you're referring to the um, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the, called the ARVIN, the Regular Army of, um, of South Vietnam, uh, we did not uh, have any uh, interaction with them. Um, we only dealt with indigenous uh, people uh, who would not, who were not in the Arvin. And so uh, we actually never came into contact with the regular Arvin. We, we worked with Montagnards, uh, Cambodians, and um, uh, Nung, who, who originally from Southern China, um, but not not with the regular Arvin, no. Okay. Uh, we're going to turn to uh, Chief Stickney. Uh, <clears throat> well, the Vietnam was the proving ground for the use of helicopters on the battlefield. What major lessons did the U.S. Army learn from the 191st and other Army aviation units in Vietnam? Oh, my gosh. Um, well, one of the major lessons is that uh, people rise to the occasion. And whereas our outfit was sent over there with the intention of being parceled out, we uh, were able to demonstrate through our, uh, I guess, willingness to perform that we could do it. And back in those days, there was no rule book. We wrote it for ourselves. <clears throat> and... So it's, uh, I, th I think we, we learned how to make rules on the fly that worked. We were very effective. The statistics, while I don't have a compilation of those, we, we set many records for aircraft availability and so on just by sheer grit of the um, mechanics that worked all night to make it happen. And so I think that's probably the, the chief thing we learned. Excellent. appreciate that. Uh, we had a question for Mr. McElroy, but uh, I think we can bring in Mr. Sanders for this as well, so with, given his uh, history background. Uh, it's about Com Duke as, the, as a misunderstood battle of the war. Uh, so, Mr. Sanders, maybe you could uh, tackle that first? Sure. Well, the, uh, the narrative uh, up until the time that uh, Jim and I had our book published uh, was that Hamduck was a monumental failure on the part of uh, the American Army. And um, Jim and I, I think, dispelled uh, uh, that common narrative. It was actually a, spect it was a spectacular success. Um, in terms of sheer numbers of 
the enemy taken out of the fight, uh, the, the, the ratio was uh, off the chart. Uh, as Jim said, uh, <clears throat> 1,500 or more uh, North, Vietnam, North Vietnamese Army regulars were, were taken out of the fight as a result of uh, the Camduck battle. Jim, I think you can add to that. Uh, yes, the uh, the reason why all the previous accounts of it uh, were radically uh, non-factual or misinterpreted is uh, there are two several reasons. The first is there was no one there. <clears throat> uh, there was no one from the uh, journal, no journalists there. So there was nobody to report on it except those who participated in it. And none of them wrote about it or at least published anything about it. And uh, the other reason is that there were, it was ter terribly disorganized on the ground. And so uh, it was a ad hoc type thing, uh, you know, just uh, extemporaneously uh, arranged. And uh, so that, that's what gave the illusion of, um, of chaos. But what they didn't, the, the uh, historians up to now have not realized is that the unity of command in the air was what won the battle, um, and all the uh, command, <clears throat> excuse me, all the uh, combat and, and transport aircraft in 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 Vietnam were uh, commanded by one four-star general, uh, General Momire, who was the deputy commander of General Westmoreland for air, and they could be immediately uh, uh, assembled and focused on on Cam Duck, and and so. That's what happened, and that's what caused the tremendous casualties on the North Vietnamese and what uh, saved us from being overrun uh, by their superior numbers. Thanks. Uh, Mr. McElroy, as a follow-up to that, uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, air assets. We had a question about Air Force personnel on the ground. Uh, were there pers Air Force uh, folks on the ground at Comdoc? Uh Yes, there were, there were uh, uh, three, three of them. They were uh, forward air controllers. Uh, two of them were professional forward air controllers. The third was a major who was a C-130 pilot and just happened to be assigned there without realizing what he was getting into. But um, the other two were extremely competent and uh, were inadvertently left behind. And uh, when uh, the C-130 pilot, uh, of, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Jackson, went back in there after everybody else had left and picked him up and rescued them, that's why they, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Wow. Great. Thank you. Uh, sticking with the air theme, uh, Chief Stickney, uh, you had mentioned in your presentation you know, about the Army Flight School lasting about eight or nine months. How many hours of actual stick time did you get uh, before you deployed to Vietnam? It was uh, about 2.20, I believe. And that was uh, split up between the primary operation where you learned how to just fly something and then the Huey transition later on, where we got kind of the other half and learned the tactics and so on that we would be using overseas. So uh, 220 is a magic number and I understand that's been cut down significantly today, but these days they have fancier simulators and things that uh, make the job a little bit easier. And so I think they can be a little bit more efficient now than what we had back then. Oh, thanks, Chief. Uh, following up on that, you know, speaking of transitions, uh, when you first went over, you know, did you get a choice whether you're going into a, a gunship or a slick, and how much interaction was there? Did, did pilots shift back and forth between the two roles? Actually, most everybody started out in slicks, uh, but not not absolutely everybody. It was just kind of what the need was at the time when you showed up at the unit, and some people had an aptitude for one versus the other. And uh, I know I was kind of self-serving. My, my goal was to build enough time so I could be marketable when I came back to America. And uh, I was going to do that for a living. And then I found out, uh, long story, that that wasn't probably the best idea for my future. So mm -hmm. I, I redirected when we got back to the States, but I still enjoyed flying a lot. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. McElroy, uh, the question here about Comduk and what were the NVA trying to accomplish and, and how did it how did the battle uh, figure into their larger strategy at the time? 
Well, uh, I'll try to summarize that. Uh, Greg, would you like to do that? He, he, he knows it as well as I do. Sure. Um, it, it's our belief that uh, the North Vietnamese were trying to score a spectacular battle victory on the eve of the opening of the Paris peace talks um, in order to gain momentum uh, going into the talks, uh, very similar to what the Viet Minh uh, had accomplished at Dien Bien Phu in 1954 uh, on the eve of the uh, Geneva Conference, which uh, resulted in uh, an end to the first Indochina War. Um, the, the evidence uh, in, in our view is abundant, particularly um, when you consider the fact that the North Vietnamese had a film crew sent to uh, Cam Duck to film the battle. And uh, it's our belief that they had intended to process that film very quickly and to get into the hands of the um, hundreds of journalists who had uh, descended on Paris for the opening of the Paris Peace Talks. Thank you. Uh, going back to the chief, uh, in your time flying there, you probably knew firsthand, uh, what was the enemy air defense threat encountered by the 191st? Was it mostly small arms or more sophisticated missiles? Yeah, well, there weren't a lot of missiles uh, in my area. In fact, I don't remember hearing about any at the time I was there. But uh, the real, the real scariest one with 50 caliber machine guns or whatever the equivalent was at the time, and you'd see these green tracers coming at you. They look like basketballs in the night. And uh, that was pretty intimidating, but mostly it was just small arms fire. And when we'd go into landing zones to drop off troops, um, you'd see tracers coming out of the tree line at you and you would get to sit there until everybody got off the aircraft or got onto it, whichever way it was going. And uh, so that helped the, the ground troops learn to exit and, and get on off quicker uh, to, for self-preservation. Right. And, and as you're actually, you know, dropping troops off or waiting for them to load, can you give our, uh, the viewers a sense of the timing? Like how long would this actually take and how long would you be exposed? Oh, sometimes... It, 30 seconds or a minute would be a long time. And ideally, if, if the uh, small arms fire was coming at you pretty fast, you tended to, to yell at the troops a little bit more to expedite, and uh, they, they would catch on pretty rapidly. Right. And for anyone who thinks 30 or 60 seconds is not a long time, I, I invite them to count to 30 while imagining bullets are coming right at them. So Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Mr. McElroy, yes. uh, question here. What role did MACV Asag play during the battle uh, and prior to the battle? Well, prior to the battle, um, it, it was a, a very big role. Uh, the uh, Kam, uh, Kamduk was a launch uh, point. It was very close to the uh, Laotian border, and, and we launched teams, uh, recon commando teams, uh, when the weather permitted. But uh, the weather was... Uh, uh, very, very often, uh, so heavy there, low overcast and all that, that helicopters could not could not uh, operate properly. Now, during the battle, um, the SOG uh, the SOG uh, participation was uh, actually critical uh, because after all of the uh, American Division reinforcement troops had been evacuated. Uh, we were uh, defending the eastern perimeter of the camp, which was the most vulnerable perimeter. And uh, the NVA launched a, the largest ground attack of the war right at us uh, after, because they saw all the other re reinforcements being evacuated. And they, they were desperate to get in there and, and capture and kill some enough people to make a film, a propaganda film, because that was the only purpose for attacking the camp. It had no other, uh, there was no other uh, reasonable purpose for uh, squandering uh, two thirds of the second NVA division on a little camp like that. So they were desperate to get there and do that. And they got so close that 
we could see their facial expressions. Um, and we, our people were, uh, were all firing as hard as they could. And I finally had to call in a napalm strike almost on top of us to keep them from getting into the camp. Because once they had done that, they would have killed or captured everybody in there. And, uh, and so that it was quite desperate. However, it was fortunate in another sense because the SOG troops were by far the best troops there. They were all well-trained, heavily armed, and accustomed to close combat. Uh, they were utterly fearless, and uh, th they were really the hardest point of the defense of the camp. And just by chance, the NVA launched their heaviest ground attack right at us. So uh, it was uh, that was really the, cre the key role of the SOG troops right at the end of the battle. Right. Um, Chief Stickney, uh, we had a question about uh, 191st, obviously, it was an assault company. Uh, major innovation. Another major innovation in Vietnam was aerial medical evacuation. Can you talk about what lessons uh, came from that area out of the Vietnam War? Uh, well, I think one of the things that they thought up um, a little bit before I got there was the idea that Sikorsky sky cranes would be uh, modified to become field hospitals. And they had these uh, pods that you could slide under the sky cranes to take them out to be uh, medical facilities in the field. Well, that turned out to be not a very good idea because of the conditions out in the field weren't very controlled. But with, with all the helicopter availability, you could get them to uh, get wounded troops to help in a real nice facility, or at least much nicer than field conditions, uh, pretty easily within 15 or 20 minutes, typically. So that became the standard. Now, we weren't a, a, a medical evac company because they had uh, special units that did that, and then they, those guys are the ones that deserve a ton of credit because they would typically go in unarmed uh, as dust off units and they just have a red cross on the side and no guns. And I used to watch those guys do that and think, boy, I'm glad I'm not them. <laughs> right. And uh, so that was, that was what we learned is we could get people to help quick. Okay. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Mr. Sanders, um, kind of bringing the, the large historical perspective. Uh, at the time of uh, the battle of Cam Duke, you know, General Westmoreland decided to evacuate uh, the site. Uh, why did he do that instead of sending in re reinforcements as, as a caisson? Well, uh, it, there, it's a complicated answer, but uh, uh, the thumbnail version is <clears throat> that uh, he learned at caisson that uh, with air supremacy, he could neutralize enemy troops in, in vast numbers. And uh, uh, Jim and I believe that uh, he wanted to replicate that at Cam Duck. So uh, uh, one of the reasons the book is entitled Bait is because essentially what General Westmoreland did was to lure the enemy to attack Cam Duck um, and uh, then to uh, quickly evacuate and leave the enemy in a very vulnerable position uh, in terms of <clears throat> uh, arc light strikes, uh, carpet bombing, which uh, killed, uh, as uh, Jim indicated, enemy troops uh, by the, literally by the thousands, uh, up to a couple of thousand uh, uh, troops. So um, if there was any kind of a, a grand tactic uh, involving CAMDUC, uh, that, that would be it. Um, I'd like to add one thing to... Uh, uh, to Roger's comment about uh, air mobility. Um, Vietnam uh, and air mobility go hand in hand. Um, air mobility completely transformed uh, uh, warfare on the ground. And one thing that um, it, most people don't understand is, is why the war was fought the way it was fought. General Westmoreland had uh, both hands tied behind his back. He was not allowed to invade North Vietnam. He was not allowed to go into Laos, officially into Laos, uh, nor was he allowed to go into Cambodia. 
um, he was left with only one choice, and that was to hunt down and neutralize the enemy. And without air mobility, uh, that would not have been possible. So it was really a helicopter war at the end of the day. And speaking of helicopters, uh, we have a question here for Chief Stickney, uh, although it would apply uh, elsewhere. So I'd, I'd ask Mr. McElroy to, to follow up after Chief. Um, it's about the individual replacement system, uh, which was the main personnel system in Vietnam. So how disruptive was that system to training and readiness for the 191st? Well, uh, we learned that it was good to infuse people with experience, with different levels of experience at different times to uh, compensate for the losses of people that were uh, reaching the end of their tours. <clears throat> so, uh, whereas if, if you just got a boatload of folks from America that were uh, freshly trained, they would all be green. And so clearly that wasn't a good idea. So that's when the idea became popular to replace the unit losses with folks that were uh, trained up from other units. And uh, I was one of those that I was in another unit when I first got to Vietnam and then I was infused into the 191st under that program with several of my buddies. So I got a chance to see that firsthand and uh, it seemed to work pretty well. Okay, uh, Mr. McElroy? <laughs> Yes, uh, the, we had a slightly different um, a situation. Um, it wasn't unique. I mean, it, other people did that too, but <clears throat> there was a group uh, in every unit, I guess, and certainly in, in most units, of people who were either professionals or, or professional quality people. They would volunteer for uh, a repeat tour, uh, and the most heroic uh, the of them all would volunteer up to four or five times. And so naturally, uh, those kind of people had a very tight unit cohesion because they were volunteering for the same unit over and over and over again. So it, 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 it had this minority who did have unit cohesion and, and great morale and all that, but the great ma majority of people uh, didn't want to be there. And so when they completed their tour, they didn't re you know, volunteer for another year, or another six months. Uh, so it, it, it worked both ways, but uh, when you were working with people who were multiple volunteers, you were working with the very best, high, highly motivated, experienced people. Great. Um, and we're going we're gonna to close out with uh, a single question that I'd like all three of you to address in turn. Uh, it says that you know, all of you had deep experiences in combat. Uh, have you had any ch opportunity to share the experiences with soldiers who are serving today? So first, uh, Mr. McElroy, then Mr. Sanders, then Chief Stickney, please. Uh, yes, in 1998, uh, I was able to go back to Camduck with uh, a, a military a joint services casualty recovery team. because There were a lot of uh, uh, people uh, on the uh, hilltop outpost of the AmeriCal Division um, who were left behind there, who were, who were, uh, who simply were not evacuated. And, uh, and so their loved ones, you know, didn't have closure, emotional closure with funerals and all that. So, um, the, the U S government spared no expense in trying to recover their remains. And, uh, general, uh, Hugh Shelton, the uh, chairman of the joint chiefs of staff at that time was my Special Forces A-Team Commander in uh, Vietnam in 1967. And he and I had a very uh, cordial relationship. And and so he uh, facilitated my returning uh, there with them because one member of our A-Team was killed there. And uh, so uh, I had a chance to talk to the young people, you know, young compared to me. Um, and they asked me a lot of questions about what it was like then and so forth. So I did interact with them. Uh, you know, for that about that two week period there. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Yes, uh, uh, in uh, let's see, it was 2014, I think. Uh, the California Military Department asked me to um, join the uh, California State Guard as a JAG lawyer uh, and to uh, embed with uh, National Guard units, and. Um, 
through that experience, uh, I have had an opportunity to speak with um, many soldiers who uh, are curious about the Vietnam War and uh, were uh, kind of indoctrinated with the, the common narrative about the war. And so um, through uh, interaction with them, I've been able to help to re-educate them and uh, let them know that there's another side to the story. Um, I think uh, we would all agree that the uh, American press uh, did not objectively cover the war. Uh, and a, a, a very prime example is uh, the, uh, the coverage of My Lai, which was uh, uh, reprehensible, but not the coverage, but the, the massacre that occurred there was reprehensible um, uh, and uh, uh, just a, a very, very bad taint uh, on the American army. Uh, but um, at Cam Duck, uh, there was a, a, a similar massacre, not quite on the same scale, but um, a C-130 loaded with civilians with the North Vietnamese army watching uh, as they were loaded we're talking about women, children, and the elderly, elderly men, uh, uh, somewhere between 150 and 200 of them uh, loaded onto a C-130. As the C-130 was taking off from Cam Duck, the North Vietnamese shot it out of the sky. Everybody on board was killed. Equally reprehensible in my view, but uh, never covered by the American press. Okay. And uh, Chief Stickney, please take us out. One of the things that I think is so often overlooked is the impact on family. And these days, uh, back, back when I was there, the turnaround on photos and letters, for example, if you wanted to send film in to be processed or uh, send a letter home and get one back, the turnaround was at least three weeks. And these days with media, you can have Skype interaction with your family, for example. And uh, that's a huge morale factor. And some of us that went over were not married. Some were, a lot were. And that had to be just a monstrous stress on, on family. And I think it, <clears throat> it's much better these days. The other thing too is, is, uh, with computers now, logistics are much more efficiently transferred from A to B. And so troops are, I think, in largest part, better resourced these days than, than what they were back in the old days where you just had to uh, take what you got and, and like it. And uh, these days, the troops are better supported. And I think it, it makes us a better fighting machine. Okay, absolutely. Again, uh, thanks to all three of you, gentlemen, for uh, for being here and being part of this event today. And I uh, appreciate everyone, and I encourage everyone to check out the books. Uh, both are available uh, through the AUSA website. And uh, now we'll turn back to uh, General Swan to uh, take us out. So thank you. Well, thanks, Joe, for uh, moderating. And gentlemen, thank you for your comments and the contributions you've made through these books. Um, especially during this week of uh, Veterans Day. I hope you all had a great Veterans Day and were able to take pride in your own service uh, to our Army and to our nation. So thank you very much for participating. Uh, before we part ways, I wanted to bring everyone up to speed on some upcoming events here at AUSA. Our next AUSA Noon Report will be next week on November 18th, and we will feature... Army Deputy Chief of Staff G-8, uh, Lieutenant General Jim Pascarette, who will be discussing some of the key programming and budgeting uh, decisions facing the U.S. Army. Our next uh, AUSA Thought Leaders webinar will be on the 19th of November next week with noted World War II historian, author, and television personality, Mr. James Holland, who will be discussing his new book, Sicily 43, the first assault on Fortress Europe. And then on the 24th of November, we will host another AUSA Thought Leaders webinar featuring 
General Thierry Burkhardt, the Chief of Staff of the French Army, who will be discussing his new strategic vision for this very important NATO ally. So th those are just some of the great speakers coming up in this program. And uh, you can uh, go to the AUSA website to learn more about each of these upcoming events and to register for those events. And finally, we want to thank all of you uh, for your support of AUSA through your membership. Membership really does matter. You help us support America's Army, which is your Army, and frankly, we can't do it without your membership. So again, go to the AUSA website at ausa.org to join or renew your membership or to update your membership information. And with that, gentlemen, again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your presentation today. And thank you, everyone, and have a great Army Day.